Um, welcome to this uh, special event at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Studies in Jewish Education. If we were at a Jewish summer camp right now, I would probably begin by saying Hakshivu Hakshivu, which means pay attention, listen up. That's how announcements uh, often begin in American Jewish summer camps, at least some of of those camps. And that's um, the kind of thing we're gonna be talking about today. I'm John Levison, I direct the Mandel Center, and I have the privilege of introducing and moderating today's event. Um, for those of you who haven't yet had the opportunity to read the book that we're going to be talking about, this book, Hebrew Infusion, I wanna encourage you to do so. Sarah, Jonathan, and Sharon, take us on a whirlwind tour of Hebrew in camp, both historically over the course of the 20th century and also more anthropologically, they, they uh, take us into camps today, a variety of different Jewish camps today. They tell the story, for example, of Camp Masad, which was a leader in the effort to create a Hebrew immersion environment as a stepping stone towards a diaspora Hebrew culture. And they show us the evolution of Camp Ramah, which actually started out being fairly closely aligned to Camp Masad, although it always saw Hebrew as an instrument for Jewish learning and connection. And uh, maybe the most amazing story in the entire book, um, I don't wanna give it away, but has to do with uh, the, the tension between Masad and Camp Ramah. You have to go to page 82 to hear about, to read that story. Um, they introduced the idea of Camp Hebraized English, C-H-E, which is the dominant, uh, the dominant language in American Jewish camps today. Um, but they also tease apart a number of different kinds of Hebrew infusion that show up in different kinds of camps. And they document the different locations where Hebrew is used. So announcements, as I just mentioned, and signage and Israeli staffers and more performances. What they show us is that Hebrew in camp is much more than a curiosity. And it's certainly much more than just an embarrassing failure to achieve Hebrew proficiency. In fact, Hebrew in camp, in American Jewish camp, is a kind of cultural space where American Jews actually work out all of the important issues that they face. So they work out issues of uh, ethnicity and religion, and they work through questions of integration and separation, of inclusion and exclusion, and even questions about how Jews are connected to local Jewish communities versus transnational Jewish communities or Jewish peoplehood. Our session today will have three parts. First, we're gonna hear a bit from the authors, Sarah, Jonathan, and Sharon. Then we'll have the opportunity to hear from our special guests, Rav Ellen Prell and um, Shaul Kellner. And then we'll open up for questions from the audience. The session is set up so that any of you in the audience can submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and those questions won't be seen by the whole group, but we'll see them and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can in the time that we have together. I also wanna note that the session is being recorded and we'll be posting it online when the recording is ready. And now uh, let me very briefly introduce our five panelists, the three authors and our two guests. First, Sarah Bunin Benoit is a professor of contemporary Jewish studies at HUC in Los Angeles, where she also directs the Jewish Language Project. Jonathan Krasner is the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Associate Professor of Jewish Education Research here at Brandeis, and he's currently working on a history of American Jewish day schools. And Sharon Avni is professor of academic literacy and linguistics at CUNY. And she's also studied uh, Hebrew in congregational Jewish education and in public schools. And our guests, Rivellen Prell is professor emerita of American studies at the University of Minnesota. She's an anthropologist of Jews and Judaism and is the author of many books and articles, including Prayer and Community, the Chavura, in American Judaism, 
And she's also herself studied American Jewish summer camping in the post-war period. Shaul Kellner is Associate Professor of Sociology and Jewish Studies at Vanderbilt University. He's the author of Tours That Bind, Diaspora, Pilgrimage, and Israeli Birthright Tourism. And more recently, he's been writing a book about the movement among American Jews to free the Jews of the Soviet Union. Okay, so if we have uh, our panelists spotlit. Um, Sarah, why don't you start us off? Um, as you think about the book now, what does it contribute to our understanding of American Jews, of language, of how American Jews use language? Yeah, so thank you. Thank you all for coming. And I'm just so happy that this book has been well received in academic circles, in practitioner circles, and in among the wider population. And um, in case you're wondering why there's a poster behind me, that's because we won the National Jewish Book Award for this book. And uh, you know, they told me to put up the poster, so I did. Um, so I, I actually have found some of the concepts that we came up with in our analysis in this book useful in my subsequent research. After this book came out, I, or after we finished the first draft, um, I started a project on Hebrew education in part-time Jewish schools. And I found some of the concepts from our book useful in analyzing Hebrew in that context, um, especially Hebrew infusion, the idea of incorporating Hebrew into the primarily English environment in multiple ways. And from that, also the broader notion of ethnolinguistic infusion, which can be useful for various immigrant, religious, and indigenous groups in understanding how they incorporate elements from an ancestral or sacred language into their everyday life in English or another language. Um, also, the notion of a continuum of Hebrew richness I found useful, that we talk about different summer camps having different amounts of Hebrew and uh, some being more Hebrew rich than others. And I also found that useful in describing part-time Jewish schools and other Jewish communal spaces. Also, the notion of Hebrew as a flexible signifier, that is not the actual meanings of the Hebrew words, but the social meanings of the Hebrew words. What, what do, does the Hebrew symbolize? And that can be different in different contexts, uh, can symbolize more religion, more is Israel, more um, the camp itself. Um, but all of these have a sense of connection to Jew Jewishness more broadly. And finally, the notion of sociolinguistic projection, I have found useful in other contexts, the idea that sometimes we see our own language through the eyes of others. And we see that in Jewish summer camps when American Jews think of words like chanutia for canteen or Pinik, personal nikayon, and they think, ooh, what would the Israelis think about these words, which are not found in Israeli Hebrew or are a mix of Hebrew and English or are American innovations in their clippings or, or uh, other forms? So those are some concepts that, that I've found useful and, and I hope others will too. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Jonathan, how about you? Great. Uh, so again, thanks to the Mandel Center and um, thanks to all of my colleagues on the, on this uh, on this webinar uh, for coming together to talk about this this book. Um, so I see the contribution of the historical section of the book um, in a couple of ways. First of all, in terms of the history of Jewish education and the history of education more generally, I think that there's been a tendency to emphasize K to twelve education to a lesser extent. Um, higher education. Um, and what I found when I was actually writing uh, about the development of Hebrew schools and the development of uh, Jewish education bureaus in my book on the Benderly Boys was that um, there were a number of key figures in that uh, story, like Albert Schoolman, uh, Libby Berkson, Benderly himself, who were also key figures in the history of American Jewish camping, but with the exception of Schoolman and his Yiddish's counterpart, Leibush Lehrer, there was really very little emphasis on their contribution in that field. It was really treated 
as an afterthought. And yet, in many respects, the camping turned out to be a far more fertile ground to experiment with progressive educational ideas that were so important to them um, than the, uh, you know, the very much maligned Hebrew and religious school. Um, in terms of American Jewish history, uh, I think that uh, historians have often written when they do write about camp, they've often written about it within the context of discourses on migration, acculturation, religious adaptation, etc. cetera. Um, but they don't, and, and of course there are uh, plenty of institutional histories or at least some institutional histories of camps, but with a couple of exceptions, there's been very little emphasis on camp as an educational and socializing institution as, and as an ideological enterprise nor has there been very much emphasis on the history of American Jewish childhood and using camp as a lens to understand that past. Um, I'm happy to say that that's beginning to change and what we're seeing, of, of course, we have Rebellion's work, but there's also work like Sandy Fox's work that, that will be coming out soon that will hopefully begin to change that. And then finally, I would say that um, the book also makes a contribution to our understanding of the Tarbut Ivrit movement, the Hebrew culture movement, and particularly the second generation. There's often an emphasis on this first generation of immigrants who came to this country um, and who tried to use uh, Hadoar and, and other literary uh, uh, tools to uh, keep Hebrew alive and 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 to um, you know discuss uh, you know issues of the day in Hebrew, um, but. Massad really exemplifies a second generation of Hebraists and their interest in trying to uh, take Hebrew culture um, and rather than propagate a rarefied literary culture, um, to really try to reconstruct Jewish life um, and to use Hebrew as an agent in an American Jewish cultural revival. Um, what could be more American than summer camp? Um, and in many respects, these camps were no different than other summer camps in terms of their landscape, architecture, the menu of activities. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that's what I thought was really interesting mm -hmm. because although they were so similar, of course, uh, Hebrew culture and Zionism is what really marked them as different um, rather than the American frontier um, and playing Indian the way that you would see in these other camps. So yeah. that, that's how I see the historical contribution. Yeah, the the um, uh, just to circle back to the first thing you said, Jonathan. The um, you know every I, I feel like on every page the, uh, the the expertise that you and 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 Sharon and Sarah bring um, to the analysis to see the way that this particular educational institution is not isolated, right? Interacts with lots of other educate, whether it's in terms of the campers, what they're bringing and, and not bringing, whether it's the counselors, where they come from, um, all of those questions, you really have to see that within the larger ecosystem of, of uh, American Jewish education. Um, Sharon, how about you? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for deciding to spend an hour of your day with us to uh, talk about this book. It's nice to see uh, lots of familiar names in the list of participants. So um, what I loved about this project, besides working with Sarah and Jonathan, was the opportunity to take an analytical lens to something that I thought I knew so well, which is both camp, because I'm a product of Jewish camping, and language, because um, that's my, my, my training. And I think uh, it was also really great to be able to look at something that often so many think of from a deficit model, that there's nothing there, that there is no camp and see, wow, this is actually a site of amazing uh, American Jewish creativity. Um, what I've taken from this project going forward is that it's gotten me to ask some questions about American Hebrew culture at, uh, today and uh, if it exists, if we, can, if we can make claims that it exists in some ways, and uh, thinking about if, if we can make claims, like what, what does that look like and where is it found? And so it's led me to do some research on something I'm calling modern day Hebraists, who are these people that I found all over the United States who are highly connected uh, not as native speakers of modern Hebrew as Israeli Hebrew, but just feel a deep connection to this language. And um, 
thinking about how uh, media and shows like Schitzel and Fauda and the sort of the, um, I call it like the Israeli invention, uh, I'm sorry, not the Israeli invention, the Israeli um, invasion, think of like the Beatles, of sort of Israeli media into the American uh, market, thinking about how that might be changing both the image and the way that we think about Hebrew in the American uh, Jewish context, and maybe not just Jewish context, but also non-Jews. So this book has been an incredibly rich way to think about how language functions uh, in the American context for me. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, thank you, um, Sharon. I would say that um, for me as well, and, I, and I, I've tried to share this with others, tried to evangelize the point, um, it's 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 such a wonderful example of uh, what it means to move away from a deficit model, right? Which is something we talk about in education often. To really see what's there, rather than um, overly focusing on what's not there. Even of course we have as, uh, educational aspirations. Good. So I want to turn now to um, Riv Ellen and Shaul. Um, I want to start, uh, Riv Ellen, with you. Um, love to hear your, your general thoughts about the book and its contributions. Thank you, John. Thank you to my colleagues who've uh, written this wonderful book. And um, it was especially wonderful to see it grow from a time when um, several of us came together and talked to you as a work in progress. So it was a very nice model for that. Actually, what I wanted to do was really say what I think the contribution of the book is. Uh, you know, when we talk about mixed methods in scholarly research, that usually means some combination of, of qualitative and quantitative methods. But I have rarely seen a book that is on its own terms a major history and an ethnographic study and some effort also at quantifying what was found. And so it's, um, it's a quite impressive model, not, uh, not simply for what our colleagues set out to do, but really for the study of American Jewish culture. It kind of puts down a marker that says, if you wanna make claims about understanding things about American Jewish culture, th this is all the stuff you actually really have to do to bring it together coherently and make it understandable. So in that sense, as we've heard from uh, the authors, this is a study of camping and Hebrew language and culture in the United States. And I just wanted to take a moment to reiterate the fact that in fact, very little has been written about the significance and importance of, of American Jewish camping. More scholarly work is being done now, but it was the lack of interest of those who were creating these camps, envisioning these camps, thinking about Jewish education to actually study this systematically. And many years ago, when I had a chance to talk to Seymour Fox, a critical figure in Camp Ramah, he expressed that lament to me. The YMC camps have been very extensively studied in terms of uh, campers' attitudes, ideas, but maybe because the visionaries were too busy, or maybe because this was just not how people were thinking about it, with great regret, we know so little about these passionate, ideologically driven visionaries, what they were looking for, um, and the sort of reflection they might have brought to this. So this study, as many people often refer to camp, about the seriousness of play is just a beautiful example of understanding how uh, the dynamics of socialization, acculturation, foundational movements in the United States, the family and childhood, much of it through this concept of Hebrew infusion and the ideas about uh, Israel and, uh, and US relationships are really brought to the fore in a work that must in some way contend with the lack of interest that really uh, was brought to bear by scholars or visionaries of the thing that they're very much interested in studying and both methodologically and in terms of our understanding of American Jewish culture, I think this book moves that conversation way forward. Yeah, great, thanks. Shaul. Great, well, thank you. And let me, let me add thanks to John and to Sarah and Sharon and Jonathan. Um, and so I'll echo a lot of what's been said. Uh, there, 
I, I blurbed the book and I blurbed it as a, a paradigm shifting work that promises to reshape Jewish educators' basic approaches to the hows and whys of language learning. So I want to elaborate on that. When I, I, I was one who saw a draft and at the time, looking at the draft, it was clear then uh, we were looking at an award-winning book and I was very glad to see that in fact, it was recognized for, 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 for the quality that, that, that it has. Um, there is a sociologist named Anthony Giddens who talks about the reflexivity of not just modernity, but social science in that we study the social world and the products that we write then become interventions that change that social world. And I see this piece of scholarship really being able to do that. There's no conventional wisdom that is in here. Um, camp educators educating in Hebrew for the most part thought they were doing one thing. They had different versions of what that one thing was, but they did not understand themselves as teaching camp Hebraized English. They did not think of themselves as teaching an, a form of American Jewish English and American Jewish language. And what this book does very, very well is it makes that the fact of what they're actually doing explicit. And once that once the that becomes part of educators' consciousness, and also once they have the language to talk about that, which you give them, Camp Hebraized English, Hebrew infusion, ethno-linguistic infusion, and, and on and on, it's not only camp educators, but it's Jewish educators in many settings, and it's other educate it's educators working with language from other communities, other, other ethno-linguistic communities that can use this to do the work that they're doing in a totally different way and be very intentional about it. So when I think of what the, what the broad implications of this are, I am envisioning day school educators and supplementary school educators um, and, and more saying, wow, wait a second, if we are actually using Hebrew as a way of teaching a version of American Jewish English, what is our version of American Jewish English? How, why do we want to be teaching this? What are our own ideologies and rationales? What are the methods that we use? What does Hebrew infusion look like in a synagogue school, in a day school? Since, since reading this, even as I'm teaching an introduction to Jewish studies class at a university or sociology of American Jews, I've made it an explicit educational goal for myself. And I tell the students this, I'm not going to make you fluent in American Jewish English, but I will, familiar, I will give you some familiarity and a, an abyssal of proficiency. Sorry for using the Yiddish instead of the Hebrew, but that's also part of the American Jewish English. Um, you know, I, there, this brings to mind another language to me, which is French. I'm remembering back to my high school French days when we read Moliere, Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme. My faith for more than 40 years, I have been speaking prose while knowing nothing of it. And I am the most obliged person in the world to you for telling me so. And I think that we are the most obliged people in the world to you, Sarah, Sharon, and Jonathan for telling us so. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I do. I I, I hear what you're saying. So there, there's um, there's a way in which the the discourse there's there's no prescription about how anybody ought to proceed, but the discourse around the choices that any educators make in camp or, or in other places will be richer because of the of the very close analytical and descriptive work that they've done. Um, let me, um, so I, I wanna pose a, a question now. I think we'll, we'll um, this will go first to Rivell and others can, can jump in. I'm, I'm curious about what emerges uh, when we think about the post-war American context, especially the baby boomers uh, who, you know, actually many of them went to camp um, in, uh, in the 1960s, 70s. Um, what did, what did Hebrew mean to them then? What, what did their experience of Hebrew in camp continue to mean afterwards? Rivellan, what do you think? So um, the, the meaning of summer camping for baby boomers was entirely created in, not entirely, nearly entirely created in light of the Holocaust. Whether these were the denominational camps that were created after the war, both within the reform and conservative movements and a little bit later in orthodoxy, or the uh, camps that preceded it, such as Zionist camps or Hebraist camps, all of them, with the exception of reform, at least at a conscious level, were reframed by understanding that this was a post-Holocaust moment. And what that meant most immediately 
with the future of an, an Israel uncertain was that American Jews might against all odds and for no good reason become the center of the Jewish world because of the Holocaust. So these camps, even reform, which doesn't refer to the Holocaust, see themselves building up and creating an entirely new generation, not immigrants, but an entirely new generation who would have to build and create and understand what is American Jewish life? What is it morally? What is it culturally? What is it ethically? And for some, Hebrew was a critical part of that, such as Massad. For others, it was critical, as this book explains so effectively, in tension with some other ideas. But whether it was a full-on effort to really create Hebrew or to begin making summer camps an Israeli landscape with naming with, uh, as, as the book explains, with all sorts of forms from signage to performance to cultural arts uh, to the creation, as Jonathan just mentioned, of a viable, vital Hebraic culture in America. That is all at work in this framework of a post-Holocaust youth movement, youth groups, youth culture, youth experiences. So what's interesting is to move this story forward. And certainly out of Ramah and the Zionist summer camping movements to lesser extent reform and others, who comes out of those summer camps is fascinating. They become the creators of secular Jewish studies. They become the absolute backbone of what was called the Jewish counterculture in its effort to create a Jewish pro-Zionist left, a alternative to synagogue life, to rethinking the nature of Jewish education, which they, the only thing they hold more responsible for their misery than their Jewish education was their parents. And so there's this idea that from this kind of creative, interesting programming, some not Hebrew infusion, but a very serious engagement with Hebrew, but also with Hebrew infusion, they begin to pioneer what will be the next vision for American Jewish life. And that's the power for the baby boom. This book, of course, is much more about the present and it's fascinating and their issues are different, but we have to look at everything about the context of Jewish American life to understand how important in particular summer camp was for baby boomers, because as they said over and over, the leaders and visionaries, this is our only chance to have them full time. It's not Hebrew school, it's not code switching. We get them and this is our moment in differentiation between their families and Hebrew and religious schools to really create a new generation with a vision of what Jewish life as we see it should be for them. Nice, nice. Jonathan, do you have a, a response to that? Thoughts? Not so much a response as an exclamation point. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, if you look, go back and you look at the uh, documentary evidence, camps at that time and, and other institutions were talking about what they called living Judaism and camp really exemplified that. Now, certainly the reform movement uses that term living Ju Judaism. They call the center of the reform movement, the house of living Judaism, but even young Judea and Camp Ramah were using that term as well. And what better exemplifies that than camp and the experimentation um, that occurs in a camp environment, a 24 seven environment. Yeah. I mean, it's particularly compelling to think of in, a, in a post Shoah world of what it's like to bring together a lot of young people, right? In a very, um, with all of that, with all of that vibrancy. Um, I want to ask a, a, another question about, uh, I think, Shaul, this will go, go to you. I'd like to ask about the idea of Camp Hebraized English, um, C-H-E, in the context of, um, of what you've written about, about heritage tourism and, and, and birthright. Um, do you see connections there to what happens within the, the heritage tourism context of you know, exploring a new, a new environment? Still muted. Um, I think that where I'm seeing the, the greatest similarity and overlap 
is that both the Israel Experience programs, writ large, birth rate in, in, in particular, um, and summer camps are using Israel and Israeli culture as a means to construct diaspora Jewish, in this case, American Jewish identities. The like birthright, for example, that people return from these trips, they don't become Israeli. Going, you know, like that, 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 that just, that's not what these trips do. They don't turn American Jews into Israelis. They help diaspora Jews to construct diaspora identities in dialogue with, in relation to this other point that they juxtapose it to. So to, now it depends on which Hebrew is being brought forward, but to the extent that camps are, are see themselves as using modern Israeli Hebrew, like that is their touchstone. That's what they're trying to bring, whether it's immersion or infusion uh, or, or what have you. Um, again, the goals in the end are to accomplish something with regard to American Jews. And I think in both instances, and this is part of, the, part of what I enjoyed about the book is I, 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 I enjoy stories of unintended consequences <laughs> and efforts to try to accomplish one thing. And in fact, you accomplish something much bigger and probably much more interesting than the particular goal that you were aiming for. I think that Birthright does that. Um, the work that I'm doing on the Soviet Jewry movement right now, looking at how, not what it did for Soviet Jews, but how it shaped American Jewish culture. That is, I'm seeing it there, and I saw it here as well. So I like those types of stories. Um, I, I, one of the reasons that I like them is because I think that, that there is a, there's a certain hubris in trying to believe that we can actually control these things, and, and, but this is, this is our nature as, as human beings. Um, and what actually ends up coming out is much more interesting. So here we have an instance of educators using, if it's modern Israeli Hebrew, modern Israeli Hebrew as a tool for trying to create a connection with Israel, but in fact, it creates, it helps to create a new American Jewish language. And the educators don't realize it. Mm -hmm. And this book comes to say, look what you're doing. Yeah. And there's a place where there's um, sort of ideological debate, right, around, um, around what the purposes actually are um, uh, between uh, different stakeholders. Um, Sharon, do you, uh, any thoughts about what you heard from Shaul? Yeah, I would, I would also like Jonathan, I'd put an exclamation point on it because I've always thought, you know, this book made me realize more and more as we as we worked on it, that we're, it's really always going to be about the local immediate camp culture. And this is about American Jewish life, even when um, we're talking about um, the use of, you know, the, the bringing in of, of uh, Israeli emissaries or creating a sort of an Israeliness at camp. Um, it's always going to be uh, really a story about American Jews, and it's you know in in conversation or in relation to to Israel, but it's not about necessarily um, not necessarily about Israel, and and um, and it took me it took at least for me it took me some time to. Um, to understand because that's not necessarily um, a given, meaning because there's a lot of resources, a lot of programming that goes into you know what it means to uh, to bring Israel into camp, and, you know to sort of infuse Israel into camp. So um, I, I I think that what it is what you know the the future of Hebrew at, at camps in general. I mean, I, I, I'm not a prophet. I have no sense of what will be in 10, 15 years. I just hope my kids get off in seven weeks to their camp. That's about as far forward as I'm looking right now. But I think that, you know, the success of Hebrew is going to be is going to be about what it, what what it means for American Jews mm -hmm. um, and their own sense of themselves. Yeah, so that's actually a, a really good segue to the next question that I wanted to ask, which is about the different ways that American Jews see themselves, the tensions um, that get played out in this space, um, as we were talking about before. Um, you could say that the debate about Hebrew is never just a debate about Hebrew, right? It's always about other things as well. Um, and so my question, I wanna to turn to you, Ravellen, first. My question is, um, as you read about Hebrew in camp, where do you see important connections to 
other ongoing debates in the American Jewish community. So uh, I want to frame this comment by saying that Mordechai Kaplan once said, this is, this is actually true, that he couldn't understand why Jews sent their children to Jewish summer camps to make them American Indians. And the fact is that with, um, with a Zionist movement, with a cultural Zionism that was so important to Rahman, other, many other camps, all this is, of course, before the war, but after all of the um, all of the need for um, the the um, misuse of American Indian experience was readily addressed. David Kaufman, among others, has written about this by making, in some sense, every summer camp that was ideologically or culturally driven to be in some way an engagement with Israel, whether it was through farming or whatever, but always to some extent with language. And so I have to say rather harshly perhaps, and certainly not optimistically, that the tremendous difficulties that beset the American Jewish community in many ways about its future relationship with Israel and Zionism, the polarization of those issues, how American Jews feel about those issues, the structures within American Jewish life that make dissent extremely difficult, that the attitudes of rank and file American Jews that are measured against a wealthy elite that dominates so much of American Jewish life and views these issues differently, how we can even have a conversation anymore about anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism are so fraught and so difficult. This will have and already has had a massive impact on summer camp, mm -hmm. such that summer after summer, um, Rama uh, graduates who have gone on to uh, participation in um, left-wing uh, organizations who want to come back to camp, who want to put these discussions about Israel-Palestine, um, have led to uh, great bitterness, the inability to communicate directly with one another. And because of everything you all have learned um, in reading this book or knowing about this research, you can see the degree to which Hebrew infusion is Zionist or Israel infusion is going to be a tremendous, uh, just a tremendous challenge. I say that with a heavy heart for more reasons than I can say about how we will be able to talk about this in five years, you know, let alone 10. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Shaul, do you have a thought about that? Yeah, um, let me actually build a little bit on what Riv Ellen said. I'll, I'll, um, I, I agree and I'll give an optimistic um, uh, period to the, to the end of it, um, which is that part of what the book does is it actually lays the groundwork for a justification of, of an American-centered and American-focused um, Hebraism that does, that's without regard to Israel. Whether people actually wanna make that case you know that that's that that's that's you know who, who knows I'm I'm not gonna predict that but the but but the book has a material for those who, who would like to do that um, you know there's so many different ideologies of Hebrew education that come through in this book the different goals of connection and proficiency and lighting a spark um, the there are the Israeli Hebrew Hebrew purists the debates on whether to translate or not the uh, the debates about whether too much Hebrew is exclusionary and you know, if I can do the spoiler, that page is at page 82. I mean, there one camp leaflet bombed another camp over these issues. You have to read the book. <laughs> um, from my perspective, I think it's great to see people fighting over language because it means that they take language seriously. And I think in, in other countries, in, in, in countries where there are clear linguistic divisions, we understand why people take language seriously. Um, I think it's I think it's a valuable thing to recognize the power of language for identity for culture i'm probably sharing one of the one of one of those modern american hebraists i'm not a native speaker i chose to speak only hebrew to my kids unfortunately i didn't have the children's language so they got raised in a in an odd um adult type set. hebrew is a second language but the point being I, I i personally take language seriously so i'm glad to see that this is a culture that actually is willing to to go to the mat on on issues of language and when you go to the mat on issues of language everything else is, is implicated in that. Nice, thanks. Sarah, what do you think? 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Ravellen and Shaul. Those were both very insightful comments. And uh, one thing that, that I noticed was certain camps have particular ideological tensions surrounding Hebrew. Um, one, we saw an interesting debate at Camp Eden Village where they don't use a lot of modern Hebrew. They try to use more textual Hebrew because they see that as the important Jewish language. And they also, some people want to avoid Israeli Hebrew because they feel that there is too much polarization around Israel and they, they want to avoid talking about Israel. And at that camp, that connection to Hebrew is implicated in that. However, you see, you don't see that in the Habonim Dror movement, where the um, there is an interesting debate about Zionism, what does it mean, and and Israel Palestine. But so far, I haven't heard people talking about um, we shouldn't be using modern Hebrew if we have concerns about the contemporary political situation there. But one thing they do in the Habonim Jor movement is innovative Hebrew suffixes um, and specifically to allow for uh, more gender inclusion. And so, for example, they say Chanichol as opposed to Chanich or Chanicha. It's a gender neutral version of camper and a gender inclusive plural, Chanichimot. And they use this in very productive and innovative ways in their camps. This was based on a youth movement resolution. And, and I see this as the kind of thing that is available to American Jews, but would be much, much more difficult in an Israeli context. They did take from the Israeli context in the emot suffix, but the chol is, is just, or the ol is um, a, an American innovation and is possible because they're not speaking Hebrew, but speaking Camp Hebraized English. It's so interesting, both how they, um, how they find aspects of Israeli culture to draw on in the emot uh, um, uh, suffix, but then also they have uh, open space to actually do something that Israelis wouldn't do or couldn't do because of, of the way that, that Hebrew works um, in, that, in that context. Um, I, I wanna pick up, and there was a, a question about, um, about inclusion and I wanna ask, I wanna pose that um, because it's already come up a, a number of times. Um, I, I'm thinking about the dynamics of inclusion and exclusion, right? Language does both, right? The speakers are in and the non-speakers are out. That can also function in terms of different folks, different kids within the any particular camp. So the, the, there was a question about um, uh, camp, uh, how, how camps have responded to the inclusion of kids with intellectual developmental disabilities. Um, so I'm curious what you what you have seen, what you think about um, so these dynamics of the use of language for purposes of inclusion and exclusion. I'm going to open it up. So whoever wants to jump in on that. Well, maybe I'll start historically and just say um, for a moment that when the Tikva program at Ramah, which was really in many ways the pioneer program um, for inclusion um, of people with, with various disabilities um, within the Jewish camping world, when that program was getting off the ground, there was a lot of resistance to the program that was um, brought up uh, that, that, that Donny Edelman and the other people who were um, that were responsible for starting the program um, that they encountered, some of it had to do with, frankly, with just prejudice about people with disabilities and a fear that um, somehow the camp would, uh, uh, I don't know, suffer in terms of its um, competitiveness um, if it opened up such a program. But one of the ways in which people were skeptical about the program was, are kids with disabilities going to be able to uphold the Hebrew values of you know, Camp Ramah, um, Camp Ramah more than most because of the uh, historical dynamics that we've already alluded to, um, was very conscious about its Hebrew speaking and um, maintaining a high level of Hebrew speaking. Um, leaving aside the fact that uh, that these fears tended to lump all, uh, you know, inclusion 
uh, people who would benefit from inclusion together without regard for what the particular issue that the person had was, um, I think it just uh, emphasizes how by the late 60s and 70s, um, and this program gets off the ground right at around 1970, that there were tensions within the Jewish community and particularly uh, among the baby boomers um, where values, traditional values like Hebrew were in tension with other values that the baby boomers um, felt, um, including uh, the desire to make the camp more inclusive, to, um, you know, to, to be concerned about justice and, you know, the, uh, in, in all of its manifestations. So yeah. that was certainly a live issue um, back then and, and I, it continues to be. Yeah, Rav Allen, that reminds me of something you've written about, the tension between, um, I think it was also in a Ramak context about the tension between um, fidelity to halacha and the concern for social justice, um, that those, right, you're, you've got real live human beings um, who are trying to figure stuff out in a community and, and having to make, make choices among values. So I, um, it, that actually, that article is about when black Jews came to campus and who, uh, to camp and who got to decide who was or was not Jewish, which was a very, very powerful uh, and profound occasion. But I, I, I just wanna reiterate how helpful what Sarah and Jonathan Bull said, which is that I responded to this question very much in large political terms but so much of camp is lived in very personal terms. Mm -hmm. And among the most compelling issues is precisely about sexuality and identity and sexual identity and language. Uh, look, I mean, Rama uh, is not fondly remembered by women baby boomers of the earliest baby boom for its treatment of women and their inclusion. I mean, this is this is a long standing story. The reform movement did it more effectively and the labor Zionist camp did it very effectively when feminists came to the fore. But I, I just think Sarah's example which by the way, here we have camps as usual leading the way in which now synagogues are trying to deal with these issues as well, how to talk about a bar bat mitzvah. I mean, this is beautiful example, in fact, of a Hebrew opportunity to think through every one of these issues and then model it for synagogue life. And so it's important to remember um, what, what are people living with on the ground in the camp experience? Their bodies, their identities, their relationships with one another. And how Hebrew infusion engages that is so exciting and, and really so important. Nice. Other thoughts on, on the question of inclusion and exclusion? Uh, sure. So when we think about inclusion and exclusion, another aspect of this is people feeling alienated if they come to camp with very little Hebrew education. And so this is something that camps contend with across the continuum of Hebrew richness, even camps that have very little Hebrew, but do their prayers in Hebrew, need to think about how much training do we have to do for our campers to make them feel comfortable? And do we need materials only primarily in Hebrew or, or also in transliteration? Or should we project everything up on the screen? Or um, And then camps that are quite Hebrew rich have to think about, do we have signage only in Hebrew? And is it okay if it's in cursive? And I, I guess Sharon might wanna talk a little more about that. Um, and, and is it also transliterated or do we expect that people will come to camp just reading this particular type of Hebrew? Um, and then also this leads to some debates among staff and boards about how much is too much Hebrew? Where's the tipping point? You know, where when we, we use Hebrew, wh where does it get to be so much that it will turn families off from attending the camp? Yeah, and one of the, you write about one of the sort of, I don't know, unintended consequences of of uh, some more hierarchies are that the either older kids or counselors are then teachers, which can actually be quite a powerful experience, right? If they are then in the role, you know, let me walk you through how we do things here. Um, that can also be a, a really powerful uh, experience. Um, Sharon, did you want to jump in? I'll just say that um, it makes me think about um, 
the linguistic anthropologist, Monica Heller, who talks about, you know, that all sorts of broader social and cultural issues get worked out on the terrain of language. And I think that, um, that in this case, lots of the, lots of issues about social justice around um, uh, whether it's, it's racism, privilege, all the things that, you know, uh, is just part of our, our discourse today. I think that they will uh, get to some degree worked out or, or at least um, they're going to, they're going to infiltrate the camp bubble and camps are going to have to take them up in one way or another. And I think that Hebrew will play a part in that. I think, you know, in different ways in different camps. I will just say to, Dan, to Daniel Olson, who asked the question, I think that there's a lot more work that needs to be done specifically about um, uh, his, his question uh, about um, uh, work with uh, intellectually challenged campers or things like that. We didn't really go into that enough, uh, but I think that it's uh, an area really ripe for, for great research. Great. Um, I want to pose a question about um, a call to use a, you know, one of those $10 academic words, materiality of, of language in camp, um, you know, the stuff. Um, so the signs and the posters and where all the places that language um, shows up and, and how it how it shows up, um, you know, in what forms. You already referred a little bit to the question of uh, cursive versus block lettering or translation or transliteration along, alongside. I'm, I'm, uh, the, the question was posed about the kind of range that you saw of how um, language gets expressed in material forms. Who wants to jump in on that? Uh, Sharon, go ahead. Oh, no, good. Did you want to say something? No, no, you. Okay. After you. Um, clearly, there's a materiality to language, and I think the book in the book we try to point out that uh, often the initial way to think about language at camp is 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 what you hear, the cheers and the songs and all of that, but that. Um, the visual displays of language and the actual material ways in which it's incorporated into camp culture do a lot of really important cultural and uh, social and ideological work. And um, in some ways, it's the lowest hanging fruit because, you know, to put up a sign or something like that is, is fairly um, easy to do. Uh, and yet, you know, it does important work. It, you know, if you go to a place where all of a sudden you're seeing a lot of Hebrew, even if you don't necessarily recognize the letters or what they mean, it has, it has value. It has, it's doing something. But I think, um, I think some of the work even on like not only materiality, but sort of the corporal nation, notion of what language is and like how it's sort of, you know, it's, it's a bodily kind of thing too. And like using your, your vocal apparatus to, to make new sounds and all of that. I think that that's as sort of interesting to me as sort of the materiality of, 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 of Hebrew at camp. Um, because in some of the interviews that I, I do more recently, you know, people talk about sort of their own, sort of their physical aspect of when they talk Hebrew or when they use Hebrew and they, you know, they take on a different posture or things like that. So I think that's kind of an interesting way of thinking about um, sort of the shape that language uh, takes in a space right. in addition to the visual aspects. But that was clearly a big part of what we found in our book. Yeah. Looking at photographs, um, historical photographs, as well as visiting camps. For me, one of the most interesting things about signage was which signs are in Hebrew and which signs are in English, even in Hebrew rich camps. So for example, you might have a sign that says brecha, meaning pool, um, but life-saving, uh, you know, instructions will be in English uh, to ensure safety. Um, or you might see no smoking in English, even though other signage may be in Hebrew. Or my favorite example, um, uh, which was Camp Ramon, Connecticut, 
where you had a big camp Ramah in Hebrew, um, but then underneath was an English sign that says, no driving on the Sabbath. Um, and clearly that was a marker, right? The Hebrew was for the kids in the camp and the no driving uh, was a marker to the parents basically uh, and saying, you know, this is the boundary between the world that we're creating and the world of the outside. And we don't want there to be any kind of confusion between that world. We want to set a boundary. Yeah. There's a methodological challenge when you're doing research on a language that you also speak because you're um, you're not coming to this with the eyes of someone to whom this is entirely foreign. And so just the fact that you, you, can, you can come to notice the signage in two ways. You're trained academically to look for it. We're going to look for the materiality of the language when intuitively we'll think of the language as something that's spoken. Or you can come to it as an outsider who you're stumbling in and I don't know what this says. And you, you didn't have that second experience. You knew You knew what it said. So but the, your ability to still see the language um, and, to, and to recognize its strangeness and its oddness in that context was a really powerful piece of what you did in the book. Wonderful. Um, uh, there's one more question that I wanted to toss out. I think, Sarah, this might be for you um, about uh, similarities, differences to um, to processes in other Jewish languages, whether it's Ladino or, uh, or Yiddish or Judeo-Arabic. I'm not sure if there are any Judeo-Arabic camps, maybe there are. Um, do you have a thought about that? Yeah, so I, I'm gonna interpret the question as being about how the phenomenon of Camp Hebraized English relates to historical Jewish languages. And I absolutely think that's a good analogy because when historical Jewish languages were created, they were versions of the local language with Hebrew words and other distinctive features, perhaps some influences from the pre-migration language that people spoke when they first acquired a Germanic language in Germanic lands that became Yiddish and a Hispanic language in, in, in Spain that became Ladino and Judeo-Arabic. And that's what's happening in America, that Jews are have acquired English, but they speak it with distinctive features. And in America, it's primarily lexical features, words from Hebrew and Yiddish, and in some communities, Ladino, Judeo-Arabic, Russian, Farsi, etc. And they also have some other distinctive features in their language. One major difference is that generally we don't write English with Hebrew letters, whereas Judeo-Arabic, Yiddish, Ladino, Judeo-Tat, Judeo-Greek, um, Judeo-Italian, they historically were written in Hebrew letters. And um, why don't we write our Camp Hebraized English or Jewish English more broadly in Hebrew letters? Because we tend to be very literate in the local language. The literacy rates overall have, have gone up. Um, but at some summer camps, you do get some examples of Hebrew lettering of English words, like kickboxing in Hebrew letters, or um, umbrella, <laughs> umbrella. Um, or I saw one sign that said, um, let us all say amen. <laughs> and it was all in Hebrew letters, right? Um, I have a paper coming that just came out about that uh, in the Journal of Jewish Languages about, about um, English words written in Hebrew letters. Great. So um, our time has gone by uh, very, very quickly. Um, the, um, uh, there's, there are a couple of questions about uh, sort of next steps, um, but I certainly hope that um, that the folks uh, who are listening uh, will will take a look at the book um, and and see how rich it is and and what opportunities there are to learn and to think about um, both theory of language but also the practice of um, of Hebrew infusion and can't can't be as English um, in in a number of different places. Um, thank you to our authors uh, Sarah, Jonathan, and Sharon. Um, very special thank you to our guests, River Ellen and Shaul, for coming uh, to join us today. Um, I want to thank uh, the folks who helped with uh, the technology on the back end. That's uh, Christina Wang and, and um, Menen Gordon, and also our team at the Mandel Center, uh, Shani Winton, who's the associate director, and especially uh, Liz Dinofo, who is our 
uh, event coordinator who is the uh, shepherd for, um, for this beloved uh, flock of sheep. Um, I hope uh, you've all enjoyed um, spending time with us, thinking about these important issues uh, as much as I have. And thank you all for joining us and be well.